G'day guys, welcome back to True Eagle. Today, I'm gonna to make this a bit of a season preview if you like. I'm gonna cover all the reasons why I believe West Coast should improve in season 2024. And I am aware that this title might invite a few non-Eagles fans to click on it to see what kind of nonsense this Eagle Nuffy is saying about why the Eagles will be good this year. So I will let you know that this will be a balanced approach. I am going to list the reasons why I do truly believe we should improve in 2024. And then I'm also going to throw a number of factors in there that make me nervous about this year and more or less construct a case against West Coast improving. So Again, we're going to start with the positives and uh, we're going to work through all the different things that are on my mind as we approach season 2024. Before we crack in, I, I just do want to say something as well. Uh, again, I want to thank you profusely for all the support on this True Eagle channel. Um, a few people saying this has been the best decision that I've made in a while and I, I tend to agree. I think I'm enjoying making content about the Eagles so much and I'm enjoying the freedom to be able to express myself about the Eagles without worrying too much about whether it's polluting the True Footy YouTube channel. So as a little update, I believe if my forecasting is correct, this will be the video that ticks me over the monetization threshold. So thank you so much for a start for helping me get there. I definitely couldn't have done it without you. And I know it's not just Eagles fans that have gotten around this channel and supported it. So thank you so much. And where that's going to lead is, you know, potentially if this channel is successful and I do have to evaluate it on the performance as well, given that I am someone who relies on his YouTube income to live. If this channel's performing well, it means I can upload more on it. And the effect that will have on True Footy is not that I'm going to stop up uploading on True Footy, but you know, there's times I've felt with True Footy where I'm in such a rush to get content out that I'm making videos too fast. And invariably there's one or two a week that just go down like a lead balloon. And sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes I look at it and I go, maybe I didn't put enough effort or time into that. So what I'm hoping is that this channel gets to a point where I can reliably make an income from it. And therefore the videos that I put on here will essentially replace the, the stink of videos that I put on True Footy. So there's gonna be a balance and there's gonna be a harmony between them. But anyway, enough of that. I just wanna let you know that is what I'm currently thinking as we get into 2024. So let's start off with the reasons why West Coast will improve. And it is important to clarify what we mean by improve because some people perceive this as you know a very biased and hunky-dory way of looking at why West Coast are gonna be a good team in 2024. But really what I'm talking about is getting a lot better than last year. And that as a base line is very, very low. So the first factor, and we're all sick of hearing it, but it is worthwhile considering, and I'm going to be specific about what I mean by this, but the improved availability of players is the number one driving factor of why we'll improve. So we're just talking for a start about eliminating five 100 point losses in a single season, one of them by 30 goals. That's That in itself is improvement. So I won't labor on this too long, but I did think it would be helpful to be specific, okay? So McGovern played nine games last year. Elliot Yo played just 10 games, not only that, but he hasn't had a preseason in about four years. So this is his first preseason. Liam Ryan, again, is injured right now, but considering he only played three games last year, you'd expect he betters that this year. Jamie Cripps only played 12 games, Tom Barras 14. Even someone like a Tom Cole, who's a bit understated, played 12 games last year. Waterman played 11 games and I think showed some real improvement. So those I think are very good, important senior experienced bodies that come back into this side that just help build a little bit of stability, help coach the players on field, certainly improve the midfield, certainly improve, improve the defensive structure. And I think that in by itself is an extremely compelling argument as to why West Coast will be better than the 2023 version. Now there is an argument out there that I've seen certainly made by Dermot Brereton that I don't think is very well thought out. And this is the idea that West Coast has gotten younger. And certainly the list profile has gotten younger, but all of those players the miss extensive time last year coming back into the side will probably make our average age older, save for the fact that Shannon Hearn, who was like 36 when he retired, is not there. But you know what I mean? I think this is actually going to be an older and more experienced best 22 on a consistent basis. So if we can prevent or reduce the impact of injuries, which have been historic, right? The other benefits are we just run out games better for a start. You know, players don't have such a diminished fitness base. Like even, even though McGovern came back and played, you know, what, like nine games at the end of the season, he obviously just missed 12 weeks. That's just one example, running out games better. The second one, which is a big one, is players actually playing together. Like, don't forget that over a two year period, not one, over a two year period, it feels like we've had about five to seven changes on a weekly basis. And it just feels like every week that progress, you get two more long-term injuries. So the benefit of that not happening, and we can, we can obviously account for some injuries, but on a massive scale, like we've seen in the last two years, if these players don't play together, how are we supposed to commit to a new game style? So that in itself should see some improvement. And there were also other games where just like structurally we were ruined. We went into a game without any key back other than Rhett Bazo, who's arguably more of a third tall 
certainly the 19-year-old version of Rhett Bazo. There were games we just didn't have enough forwards, so we played Andrew Gaff and Luke Edwards in the forward line. So if we can get to a position where we're at least playing players in their desired roles, then that is a huge improvement. On top of that, we've added three best 22 players. One of them is Harley Reid, and he is going to be best 22 for sure. Tyler Brockman will arguably be a best 22 player, as will Matthew Flynn, who I know is out for 12 weeks. But we are talking about, you know, the season as a whole in the second half of the year. There's no reason to suggest that Matthew Flynn won't improve us, considering how weak our ruck is going to be without him. So to summarize these points, I had a look at what happened last time we played Port Adelaide at Adelaide Oval. So if we're looking at this through a round one lens, that is our opponent in round one, we should have at least nine significant changes to the 22 or 23 that lined up against Port Adelaide that day. Now, bear in mind that actually, I think we lost that game by about 45 points and we didn't play horrifically. But either way, nine changes is significant. So there's one that's probably a downgrade. So Luke Shuey comes out of this team and he only played 10 games or something last year, subbed out three times, but when he did play, he was fantastic. So losing him when he's playing well is a bit of a blow. So we sort of downgrade him to Harley Reid, but you know we're optimistic that Harley Reid can close that gap over the course of a couple of years. But some other genuine upgrades. So Josh Rotherham would come out. Brady Hoff comes into this side. He didn't play that day. Rhett Bazo comes out. Jeremy McGovern comes in. Greg Clark gets upgraded to Elliot Yo. Connor West gets upgraded to Jamie Cripps. Petrevsky Seaton gets replaced by Tyler Brockman if he's available for this game. Jai Cully, who did have a good game that day, gets replaced by Ryan Marrick. Luke Foley gets upgraded to Tom Cole. Zane True gets upgraded, depending on your opinion, to someone maybe like Campbell Chesser. So that's nine changes, and I'd say seven of them were big upgrades. One of them a slight downgrade in Luke Shuey to Harley Reid, and then one that's possibly a little bit debatable in Zane True to Campbell Chesser, because Zane True had a good end of the year. So for all this talk as well about us being a younger team, like that team should get more experienced and better. And, and consider how many of those players I just mentioned in Greg Clark, Connor West, Petrevsky, Seaton, Foley. Those players were all delisted. They were in that best 22 when we played Port Adelaide. So we're hoping to see some genuine upside from that. Just to be clear, this is not a case to be made for why we're going to beat Port Adelaide in round one. I don't believe that to be the case. It's just a really good example of how much better this team should get. Further to that, we are not by any stretch the youngest team in the competition. We are 16th for age. I think Hawthorne and North Melbourne are, are younger and we're 14th for experience because we do actually have 11 players with over 100 games experience. So this is a very theoretical argument. I don't expect people to put so much weight into the fact that we're not the youngest list in the competition. That's why we're not going to finish last. But I do think that might hold back someone like a North Melbourne who have who just like bursting with young talent absolutely no doubt and probably accumulated better and younger prospects than us and it certainly goes deeper that list but they do have a lot of young players and when you compare it to us like in theory ours should be able to last longer throughout a 24 game season but nothing about North like this isn't necessarily about North at all but it is a vague reference to the fact that I did put us higher than North in my ladder prediction so that leads on to what can we expect from our youth so this is often an argument that gets made for why teams should improve for us, I don't think that's actually that strong. I don't know how much improvement from young guys is going to help us. I've made a case very much on the senior players coming back into the side. That, in theory, should help us develop. It'll help the younger players develop for a start. But there are some players on the list who should, in theory, get incrementally better this year. So one of them is Ruben Jinbi. You know, I think the thing with Jinbi is that he can improve our team just by being there because he is quite a good defensive midfielder. He's super quick, great endurance, great tackler. And that just stands out as something this team lacks. Brady Hoff is another one who probably is at the point where he is genuinely good enough to improve the team for being in it. I think this could be a big breakout year for him. Then there's some guys like Ryan Marrick. He just had his first preseason. Noah Long, Elijah Hewitt, Campbell Chesser. Now, I do expect these guys to improve, but I don't think it's a strong argument to suggest that these guys will drive the improvement. I think it's got to come from everything that I mentioned prior, but hopefully the mature guys being stable in this team, your McGovern's, your Yo's, if they can staunch the bleeding, we're going to lose games. But if they can stop it being horrific, then that will in turn improve the development of the younger guys that I just mentioned. So the reasons against us improving, and uh, there are a few, let's be real. Um, okay, so first of all, if we are doing it as reframing it as, will we avoid the wooden spoon? Yes, I did predict that, but in my head, that's not what improving is. But if we were to go down that path, then there is an argument to be made that North Melbourne will improve much quicker than us. Now for them, I think the upside is probably going to be coming from LDU getting through a full season. That'd be a great start. And a lot of the youngsters just exploding quickly, which I'm not expecting ours to do. So I'd expect North Melbourne's like young under 21 group to perform better than ours this year. So my overarching point is, and I've accidentally dragged North Melbourne into this again, is that it, I do hold space for the possibility that North Melbourne do improve more than us. But to be honest, I'm not too concerned whether we finish lower than North Melbourne. If we can really rectify some of the issues we saw last year and get five or six wins, but still come last, I don't know how realistic that is, then that's fine for me. And 
I'm, I'm completely fine with North Melbourne being better than us if it happens that way. Okay, so let's rattle through some of the reasons against us. First of all is, do we really trust the injuries to stop? I won't labor on this point. I've done an entire video about it, but in particular, I think our midfield is hanging by a thread and I'm worried that if someone like a Tim Kelly misses football, then it goes from being the worst midfield in the competition to being one of the worst we've ever seen. And again, last year, it certainly hit that threshold of being close to the worst midfield we've ever seen. Again, this isn't helped by the ruck issue. Matthew Flynn out now again, Matthew Flynn is not necessarily an A grader, but he does add something different to what we had. And it was already such a tenuous hanging by a thread midfield and ruck combo that one reason we had to be optimistic about us improving in the contested ball inside was Matthew Flynn coming in and giving us a different look. So hopefully we get, get him back mid-year, but obviously it's hanging by a thread. And equally, again, I'll point out key position depth. McGovern or Barasmus, Edwards and Bazo are already injured. So I'm, I'm a little bit worried about those, but we won't labor on injuries. There's some other issues. So I talked about the midfield already. Scores from stoppages. Last year, we had to be the worst team of all time at scores from stoppages. It's a horrific stat. Again, I've done an entire video about this topic. We also go into this season without Dom Sheed. Now, I... <laughs> I like Dom Sheed. Uh, we will forever be indebted to him, but I actually don't know if Dom Sheed coming back into the side would markedly improve us. Not because I don't think he can be a good player, but his deficiencies echo what the team's deficiencies are. You know, he's not a great defensive runner. That being said, you probably pick him in round one, but again, like he comes into the season with limited preseason, and I'm worried about what a no preseason Dom Sheed is likely to produce on field this year. So, like I said, we're extremely vulnerable to injuries of Elliot Yo and Tim Kelly. Touchwood again. This does concern me because Tim Kelly's been pretty durable lately and he has pretty much put his team on his back several times throughout the last couple of years and I am a little bit nervous about that and it does kind of place a lot more importance on Jinbi than it should. And just generally, generating inside 50s has been really poor. So as much as I've made the argument for like mature players coming and improving this side, there's, a, there's another aspect that makes me a little bit worried in that none of those experienced middle age players are midfielders, which sucks. I mean, Elliot Yeo's 30, so not an age player. He does come in to reinforce the midfield, but I also look at some of our delistings last year, and this is a good symptom of what is a big problem on our list, right? So Clark, O'Neill, Foley, SPS, and Connor West, all delisted last year. All of them, in addition to the three retirements, but all of those guys are in the middle 21 to 27 age bracket, which is where you generally see improvement. So we've sacrificed five of them, and I don't think that we should have necessarily kept any of them, but that kind of really exposes how bad our 21 to 27 age group is. So guys in this age bracket should be driving improvement. So let's look at the, the meaningful ones we have on the list that could drive improvement. So there's Oscar Allen, he could improve. He could improve. He had a great breakout year last year and looks to be in good form this preseason. That being said, he already had a great year. Liam Duggan, he could improve. That didn't look too hot in the preseason, but again, it is just preseason. Jake Waterman getting a fit run at it, I think could improve us slightly. I think he has what it takes. Jermaine Jones has also become a pretty good player, but I don't know how close he is to his ceiling. Petricelli could really go either way. My thoughts on Petricelli are that he kind of needs to be in a good team to look good, but I do think he has talent. So if we can even the midfield battle out, if we can get a few more inside 50s, I think Petricelli could appear to be a better player without necessarily improving. Tom Cole, how much is he going to improve? Luke Edwards. I do think there's some upside with Edwards there, but we are sort of, you know, getting closer and closer to the time where he's probably had enough time. Alex Witherden, you know, pretty good preseason so far, but again, none of these players are necessarily in important positions with the exception of Oscar Allen and maybe Liam Duggan as that driver off halfback. It's not the most inspiring 21 to 27 age part of the list. And I am a little bit worried we're in the position of expecting too much from our young guys to drive that improvement and it might not happen quickly. So I'll rattle off a couple more. Uh, retirements of Shuey and Hearn, they do hurt, but not massively. Again, you know, Brereton made the point that we're getting younger, so therefore we must get worse. But Shuri played 10 games, and while he was BOG in a number of them, he was subbed off three times in that period and twice very early. Hearn played 13 games and was somewhat reliable in those games, but not anywhere near his best form. So while I do think those are two genuine best 22 players we just lost, they also didn't play a lot last year. And finally, uh, the other thing that makes me a little bit nervous is the tough fixture to start the season. So I'm not expecting us to beat any of Port in Adelaide, GWS in Perth, the Bulldogs at Marvel, and Sydney at home. Like that could get horrific for us. Now, what we're hoping for is like to be competitive in those games. You know, if we lose each of them by three goals, then that's a big improvement. But what I'm a little bit worried about is if we get blown away by a quality side in port in round one, the morale and the motivation of these players might take a big hit. And I do think that kind of makes me a little bit nervous. You know, if a lot of young players get their confidence bashed in round one, the media narrative 
starts to pick up, it kind of just makes me wish we had a bit more of a winnable game in the first month of the season. Not to necessarily win it, but to, to get close in a few of these early games, I think is going to be important. And I think this is something I'm a little bit nervous about. Again, improvement's going to be measured over the course of a season. You know, if we're 0-4 and they're all bad losses to start the year, I'm not going to write us off as being a chance to improve this year. Again, consider how low the baseline is. So those are my ramblings, you know, reasons for and against why West Coast will improve. But to summarize, to summarize, I've kind of just switched from one side to the other making impassioned points. To summarize, I do think the argument for us getting better than last year is, is strong, like just simply on availability, whilst also playing down the idea that, that the under 21s on our list will really drive that improvement. They can improve individually, but even if they do individually improve, I'm skeptical that it's going to drive genuine team improvement. So I do think that improvement's got to come from the senior players, which rests on players staying fit for a start. And, you know, generally on-field leadership, the morale of the group being up, I can see it going either way. But again, like it's a big call to say we won't get better than we were last year. So with that being said, I think there's got to be a minimum improvement we should expect. And I think if all those things go right for us, like we keep a lot of those guys intact and we get Kelly and Yo at least playing most of a season, if not absolutely every game. If we get a backline structure with at least two key, key position backs and we're not like completely fighting with one arm behind our back, then I think that should result in about five or six wins and, you know, hopefully around 75%. And to be honest, if we don't hit that, if we if we have four wins and our percentage is 68 and we've had a decent injury run or at least AFL average, then I think I think that is at the point where we say, no, thank you, Simo. And I'm a Simo fan. I'm not campaigning for it. I'm just saying that the reasons there are to improve are so strong. So while it may sound like I'm optimistic about the Eagles, by the same token, that needs to come with some expectation. I do think we need to improve. And therefore... If that doesn't come, then heads need to continue to roll. So there you go, guys. I hope that came across as a balanced take about what I expect from the West Coast Eagles in 2024. Again, I'm still optimistic we improve. I still you know, have this feeling we're going to avoid the spoon, whether that's North Melbourne or not. I don't care, to be honest. It could be somebody else. But you know, if we do get the five or six wins, statistically speaking, someone is more likely to get less than that and we'll avoid the spoon. So that's my prediction. And if you disagree with it, comment down below. But as always, I appreciate you watching. Let me know your thoughts on this upcoming season, any concerns you have. This is a safe place for Eagles fans. And of course, opposition fans, you're more than welcome to, to come in and give us your input as well. We just ask that you be respectful, which most of you are, to be fair. So I appreciate you guys and I'll see you later. Cheers.